I've seen someone get uh, baited as well on a flight where this girl, an influencer, sat in business class, got the photo, and then someone else has got a picture of her sat in economy. So she just sat in someone else's seat, first on the plane, just to get the photo, and then goes to sit in her seat in economy. No way! Welcome to the podcast, everyone. We are talking about clickbait culture and its impact on society. This is a big one, Jackson. It's very important. I think all of us are hot under the collar with this subject. Yeah, man, I agree. It's no secret in today's world, there are experts all over the internet and who are not only too happy to dish up advice, their success stories, testimonials, forced opinions on all of us. And I see them every day when I scroll down my feed. Well, I think we have to be careful today in this conversation that we don't go over the top and like just you know death to social media and fucking shit like that in as much that i think we can all say it's done an awful lot for for the world as well right and, and you know we have to kind of keep that in context as we look at the, the kind of aspects of it uh that aren't particularly great or can be improved what do you think yeah but i feel like there's a bunch of for every person who's offering valuable information that you need to hear there's like 95% of people offering you things that you might want to hear and then it's just totally unattainable. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you see it all the time. It drives me nuts. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. And also, it's not that it's just fake, uh, disingenuous, uh, not well thought out. Uh, it creates a channel all of its own, lives in its own kind of universe. It feels very unhuman to me. Um, and and I, I don't like it, i got to be honest. Well, the big chatter today that our guest out of the pandemic we've got the pandemic of anti-vaxxers that are coming through that feel quite strongly about taking a uh, vaccination. Our guest today actually has an opinion on this and he had something great to say, which ended up traveling a few miles. I also saw it outside of what we're about to play you. He isn't a scientist or a doctor, but he's completely upfront about that. And let's check out what he had to say about anti-vaxxers. Vaccines year on year save millions of lives. And even the World Health Organization in 2019 posed one of the biggest top 10 threats to humanity, the anti-vaccine movement. Basically a load of dumb c Same ones that probably think the world's flat. Gone down the rabbit hole of a few too many YouTube videos. Now I've got a few issues here. We got Dave tweeting, not even that in me, Dave. You've been banging lines of Charlie up your nose for the majority of lockdown. Cocaine probably imported in another man's rectum. Don't know what's in that vaccine. Worst part is, same guy is on a drink driving ban, lecturing Twitter about the safety of a vaccine. You got in your car and drunk drove, mate. You were driving drunk. Same weekend, you were snorting powder from another man's rectum. <laughs> oh my God. Listen. James Smith, fitness expert, best-selling author, militant enemy of fake experts online, and he's our guest today. Welcome to the Jax Jones and Martin Warner Show, mate. Thank you very much for having me. I'm always a little bit on edge when what clip is going to be used to introduce me. And I'm just sat on the edge of my seat going, oh, where have they gone with this? But I quite, I'm quite proud of that one. There was one on TV, Irish TV the other day where 80% of it was just beeping out my swearing. And I was thinking, what producer has gone, that's the clip we're going to use for daytime TV? I feel like your usage of swearing is for colour and emphasis and making it entertaining. Or is that just how you speak all the time? You haven't sworn yet so far. Um, it's, it's kind of half tactical because I see so many people in my industry doing the same mundane rubbish content where they're like, overly happy on screen hey guys today we're going to talk about the benefits of avocado and i'm like no one gives a f and sometimes if you can peacock in the other direction you know call someone an offensive swear word and someone's ears perk they go hold on you said this was a personal trainer why is he calling someone a c word and yeah, yeah. it's my way of kind of you know separating myself from because the industry i'm in i'm not very proud of i think the fitness industry is full of wankers so the, the further i can space myself from it the better time I'll probably have. I, I mean, for, for, throughout my life, I mean, I, I, you know, my wife says I swear too much and all the rest of it, but I'm not sure if that makes me a bigger wanker or a le lesser wanker, right? <laughs> you, you differentiate yourself, but it all, I guess it all depends on your audience, right? You know, and, and whether they see the authenticity in you and then it becomes a really tactical tool, right? Because, you're, you know, you're, you're sending an alert when you use that kind of expression but they really know who you are. It's, it's a cultivating tool as well. I feel like I've got a constant sieve and I'm just sieving out the shit people where, <laughs> yeah. you know, just fall through. If you're offended by that, then, then f off now. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. in a month's time, when I put on my story that I've just dropped a pill at a festival, 
you're going to be fuming and reporting me to Ofcom. So if I can get you out the soonest, then you're left with quite a loyal following. Because I see some people in my industry, they slip up and their followers go for them, try and cancel them. If I was yeah. getting caught doing like a, you know, like a, was it Danny Dyer who got caught on CCTV doing a line? And everyone was yeah. like, it's just Danny Dyer, mate. You know, no one was trying to cancel him. I feel like a, a bit like the eight mile rap at the end. If I can get everything out there, then, then you're fine. You're protected. You can't be cancelled. To be yeah. fair as well, yeah. it's, it suits certain people and it suits you. When I'm listening to that clip and watching the, the rest of your content, it, it, it feels genuine. And I, that's why I swear. And I often... But there, there's times when not to and it seems like you know when it's appropriate. I mean, so I think it's safe to say that between the three of us, we have some very strong opinions on a lot of things. You're in the fitness industry, but also most most recently COVID and anti-vaccine. And in your industry, health and fitness, you're known for exposing toxic myths. For example, fad diets. You've argued that it's based on flawed views about fat loss. And I want to pick on something big. There are a lot of influences in health and fitness, right? I mean, I see them all the time. It's basically like, light pornography and as you can argue they look good so people would listen would you say that's fair i think uh i've i've spoken about something called a uh, swimmer's body illusion where a lot of people think that if they swim they will look like swimmers so you know if you wanted that physique you could do it but after a few months in the pool you'd realize that people don't look the way they do because they swim they swim because of the way they look and the same with rugby players people go oh you're big and broad because you play rugby and people go no they were big and broad, so they played rugby. So there's this kind of selection criteria that like wriggles people out. If you're rubbish at putting on muscle, you're probably going to become a runner because that's something that you'll perform well at. And you go to the gym, didn't see anything. I'm not surprised you quit. Now we do have a percentile of the population from a genetic standpoint. We do not have to work very hard to look like a Greek god. So they may say to them, you should become a personal trainer. So we've got these people who... It's probably half environment, half genetics. You know, they're very caught up with the way they look. If you if you grow up looking like a Greek god, it's soon going to become your identity. So if you start losing that physique, soon you're going to lose who you are and your identity and you don't mind being hungry or saying no to six months of going out drinking. So when you do find these people that wriggle themselves to the top of these, you know, social media algorithms, it's not always because of their empathy, their intelligence, their intellect. A lot of the time, They've ended up there by default and then they can just, they, they're often, no offense to a lot of them, they're not the most intelligent some of the time. So they just have to create some kind of system they can sell or a marketing team latch onto them and go, this guy looks f-ing amazing, this top off. Let's create some multi-million dollar system that we can just rinse his followers that want to look like him. I feel like that's most entertainment, <laughs> what you've just described. But I guess there's also the transitionary view, right, James? I don't know how big that number is, right? So you're willing to apply yourself for five, ten years. You know, you're an exercise, uh, you're, you're a disciplined person. You can create the body you want, right? I mean, I guess, is that the environment bit you're talking about? I mean, I guess if I wanted to be ripped, and believe me, I don't look that bad at 49, but I could look a lot better. <laughs> two, but, two, but, you know, wait, but, just because you but, dropped a bit of weight, you're coming on with the big chat. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I've got no f***ing rip. Yeah, exactly, that's it. But what I'm saying is you can get, I mean, it's not a loss of hope for people, right? They can transition to that that body. Absolutely. And I mean, the first thing that they should do with that, though, is not to find someone that's on Instagram and go, I want to look like that. Because taking right. someone from where they are to that is often a route they may not enjoy. A lot of people come to me thinking that a six pack's going to make them happy. I'm like, sure, let me give you the tools, but let me remind you, you're going to have to give up a lot of happiness to get there. And what I like to think with people is, let's say we were to summarize someone's current state of fitness and well-being out of 10. If there are three, I'm like, let's get to a four. Let's see how hard Mm. we have to work to get to four, then a five. And what a lot of people keep out of conversation, I completely agree with your point, is that very soon, and it's subjective with everyone, there is a point where your fitness ambitions and your lifestyle clash. And I think we need to have more acceptance over that. Someone to say, look, you're a CEO, you go drinking three times a week, you're married with two kids, you want to be at an eight, I think you should get happier being a six and a half because you get to Mm. live the best of both. But if that guy is is constantly looking at that Instagram influencer with, you know, that travels on six holidays a year with a ripped six pack and big chest, then I there's always going to be this slight kind of unhappiness they're going to experience. So I, I completely agree with what you're saying. But at the same time, I think that, if I can give people a big dose of reality, they can disconnect from these ambitions they often have that can be unrealistic. Mate, I um, I must admit, only in the last 
few years have I started to be more aware of my body and it's probably because of these like high priests of low cult that you're seeing online and then you kind of you kind of get this feeling of what women have experienced for many many years right and as a bloke for me what took me over the edge was love island I can't lie to you bruv when you got people on there talking about five foot nine is short I'm five foot seven what the hell am I a midget bruv do you know what I mean and then (laughs) And then you've got the uh the way um they present the like everyone's muscular on there and they starve themselves for six weeks beforehand to present a certain thing. The question is though, isn't that what we've always seen in media? We've always seen this per like person performing at a certain level and they don't need to discuss into the magic of how it all happens. It's just we're overloaded with it because we we've got social media where it's basically like a daily TV. Do you know what I mean? I think that, you know, any brand that wants to take their brand to market wants someone with a chiseled jaw and, you know, great exactly. ratios and shoulder to waist ratios and all of these things that are kind of depicted. But that's always been like in this top echelon of advertising, which people have been quite immune to. But when, like you say, with Love Island, that becomes a part of your daily routine. It makes you feel like you know these people. And like you say, they are selecting the top tiers of their like, okay, this guy, six foot five physique of thor you know this person here but then like you say it's quite damaging when they are saying oh you know um what was it was it jack that won a few years ago and everyone kept calling his belly a derby like you know they're like oh you know he's oh, he's a bit fat to be on love island a lot of women love that physique you know um, the amount of times if i get lean there's girls i'm dating they're like i don't like this they're like i preferred you a bit thicker and we're almost separating you know what the true desires of people are and the true desires of what TV wants. And you do get this kind of separation and there is always going to be issues with that, with diversity, with physiques, with, you know, you're talking about being heightist, which again, so many girls on dating apps at the moment are like, don't message me unless you're six foot. Mm. And you're like, whoa, can you imagine if a dude was on there going, don't message me unless your boobs are this size. So then we're getting onto body dysmorphia. So I feel like, that's an issue that's becoming more prevalent today. And you can, would you say that social media is a good space for health and fitness generally? Like, does it have a positive impact overall? Probably not, if I'm honest. Uh, Social media to me, although I use it and my business completely runs off of it and I'm completely online, I see it as a very toxic and dangerous space because one, it's very easy to image and edit photos. I know several influencers over, but they're not friends, over a million follower mark who have full-time people doing edits on their photos and the kardashians have come to light as well as someone else that's been doing it so i think body dysmorphia is is a big thing i think with men especially at the moment the amount of anabolic steroids being used are going up and that's in films as well and like i don't mean to out people but you know like tom hardy one of my favorite actors there's no way he wasn't on a bit of juice when he was playing uh the character in Warrior and in Bane. And you know what? If there was a bit of transparency with that, just someone putting their hand up and going, hey, look, I'm not advocating this. I used a team of doctors. I had my blood works done each week, but to play the part of this role that was very important to me, I went on testosterone. It's one of those things that we do this all the way in our culture of suppressing the fact, everyone just pretends that drug use doesn't exist. Same with cocaine, same with anabolic steroids. You know, it's everywhere. And everyone just Mm. kind of turns a blind eye to it. You go to any posh establishment in London, there's more sniffing going on in the toilets than shit. And I wish that there was just more transparency with this, especially anabolic steroids, because dudes are going to watch that film and they say to me, how do I get really rounded shoulders? And part of me wants to say, well, the shoulders you're talking about are the ones that are from anabolic steroids, you know, but I'm, what am I supposed to say to them? Two grams of protein per kilogram, bro. So yeah, we've always yeah. got this kind of uh, unspoken element online, which makes people's Goals very skewed. I think that the I think the, the problem with this is that it's it's that it's that people are influenced by what they see on social media. Because if the influence was taken away, no one would give a shit. Like I don't really care. I love Bane, right? I love Tom Hardy, right? but I don't really care how he got to create that role, right? I'm not looking to understand if he took anabolic steroids. I want to see him for what he is. The issue becomes. The minute someone looks at someone and thinks, well, I want to be like that or I've got Mm. to compete with that. And it's this concept of influence. And in the real world, we would call that misrepresentation. And that's probably the the challenge. So, 
you know, as an example, the Kardashians, um, you know, the, the, this, this view that, that they were born perfect. But we all know that's not true. You don't have to be smart to realize they've cut their bodies up, right? And, and, and done that, you know, since day one. So why is any more, why is image editing any real, any, any different, right? And, and if people do that, the real decision is, do you care about the influence? I wonder how much of it, other than being really frustrated by misrepresentation, does it really matter? Other than the fact that we're creating a channel that's just got aspects of it that's just not fun to be in, James. What do you think? I think that, um, I think people do care a lot. And I think that there are a lot of people out there that spend the majority of their life looking through their phones at these people. And the prevalence of it isn't quite so much now. Uh, I've had a few legal letters from a lot of these companies, but Boombod, for instance, you saw people from Geordie Shaw, The Only Way is Essex, you know, promoting Boombod. Here's a before and after transformation. And I would have to step in and go, guys, the iPhone got older in the transformation. Is no one seeing this? This is an iPhone from two years ago. This is not a transformation. And I know that- Wow. Had, yeah. And, and that's, I, I got a lot of my growth over the years for calling these people out. And it, it's one of those kind of, for me, it's, it's half and half. It's half, let me get this message out there. Two, let's make this so bold and brash that we can spread the word. And then people started coming down on these celebrities, but celebrities, inverted commas for listeners. Uh, but then, you know, Katie Price a year later would be doing it. And you're like, hold on, that business must be profiteering from its advertising social media strategies to be slapping 10 grand in someone's pocket to do it again. And then you see mm -hmm. another guy from Geordie Shaw, then another guy from The Only Way is Essex. Unless these marketing schemes of paying people 10 grand was not producing significantly more than that, they would not have an endeavor that continues. So from a basic business standpoint, I think that people do succumb to this stuff and they do think that it's a pink gel that people drink three times a day. And it's not the fact that people are exercising, losing weight, or in most cases, just repeating old photos or sucking in the gut. Do you think um, when you're calling out people like that, and also let's talk about like the Kardashians, where you mentioned, uh, Martin mentioned about the fact that they clearly had work done, but the fact they don't say it, and you call these kind of incidences, it just heighten their fame. Do you know what I mean? And make people look at it more, if I'm being honest with you. Like, I'm looking at here about the Are You Beach Body Ready campaign. And despite the backlash against Protein World, the hype around it caused the company to explode and become even bigger and one of the biggest in nutrition. Do you see that a lot? Or does it actually work when people try to point things out? Do you know what I mean? So sure, we'll tread carefully here. But one of the ones that's been, the wave that's been ridden this year is the body positivity movement, where... Mm -hmm you will have a, only can be described as a plus size model. I think they'd call themselves that to then be the front person for a nutrition or branding business. And then in the caption, it could, I remember seeing one and I'm not trying to scrutinize the person in question. It said, I haven't lost any weight through do, using this, but it's been great for my mental health. So <laughs> you're seeing, you know, a body positivity wave being used and then a mental health card being played as a, you know, no reverses, you know, just say no in Monopoly deal. So then you've got this echo chamber where the comments are filled with people going, oh, you look great, you're beautiful, baby, all of these things. But all of the people that are sat at home going, what the f is going on here? Mm -hmm. They're not going to comment. They're not, they're too scared for the scrutiny. So people are going to play this the whole time and people will send that to all of their friends going, oh my God, have you seen this? And like you say, it is a, it's a porn, it's a porn move just by these people and they probably get much better rates at hiring a plus size model than they would a fitness chick who's got half sure. a million followers you know so there are these games being played by brands and we've seen a lot of brands bend over backwards to certain initiatives with you know whatever it is and and people can see through it but like you're right even the worst criticism cosmopolitan put in the 12 different not normal athletes on the front cover okay. and saying this is healthy they knew what they were doing they knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah. I think that what you're saying about body positivity reminds me of mindfulness, that kind of era. And then you've also, now mental health is the big tagline. And it's kind of like, they're also, the areas are, so, they're not very tangible, I guess, where you're talking about physique. If you can hang everything up to mental health or hang it up to mindfulness, like these kind of ideas, it's very easy to kind of knock it off. And what I've noticed about even um, things that are positive, like, being in the present moment becomes this big cult across social media. Anything that was positive in it just gets drawn out 
where any it's almost like if you're not doing this you're a terrible person and that kind of what you have these trends every few years um and i just uh, that i feel is damaging as well because then you, something that's quite even something like mindfulness and meditation is a beautiful thing but then people treat it as if it's the sole antidote for your whole life do you know what i mean uh or they you see these fitness people who say yeah if you do this workout you're gonna get a huge ass and then your life is perfect do you know what i mean and it's like i think that's the bad side of socials but the other the positive of it in terms of the question was i see it also on a very surface level, encourages you to do something with your body. Do you know what I mean? To work out, move. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely got its, its positives to it as well. And I mean, social media, I think, has been uh, great for... Imagine in, in your line of work, there are probably artists that in the onset, the powers that be in you know music production were like, nah, this is never going to take off. And they see the traction on social media and then they're like, oh, actually, we will get them along to a gig. We will get them as a support act. People can almost circumvent the system now. And I think mm. that is an amazing thing in the fitness industry as well. Uh, you're always kind of fighting this uphill battle. And like you say, the meditation people say meditation's the key. The CrossFit people say it's CrossFit. The physios say that, you know, that's going to keep you safe and this isn't. And it does become quite culty in these different areas across the board. And yeah, it, it's kind of an interesting landscape and it's definitely moving quite quick. And I mean, you always have this sweet zone, but everyone seems to always overshoot it. And it kind of ruins how valiant that sweet zone was i mean we saw it with veganism veganism what a fantastic cause the fact you are not eating animal products in a bid to save the animals awesome then the overreachers that stand outside of butchers uh telling you not to go in or the people that go to a dairy farm and say that milk is rape you're like whoa hold on you you're now making the rest of vegans look bad and then you know you feminists what a fantastic cause the liberation that's happened in the last 10 20 40 years for women and women's rights. And then you've got suddenly the anti-men crew that clutch, on, clutch onto that. I think in the fitness industry, as you said, we've got this amazing kind of central part of so many movements, but then we always have the extremes of this. And unfortunately, when you're playing an algorithm-based game where you're trying to get the mass exposure, the mass amount of clicks, you're always going to use the furthest overreaching elements to support your initiative. Well, let's talk generally about how some people get their information online. We've been crowned Kings and queens online, I've called them the high priests of a low cult. Uh, we see them all the time. Anyone, the funny thing is you mentioned about music production. It's like you could spend years and years learning your craft and perfecting that. But that doesn't matter when it gets onto social media, if you can present it in the right way, right? But in your eyes, James, what are the biggest issues with social media and information online generally? For one, myself included, there's no gatekeepers or barriers for qualifications. So I'm just the level three personal trainer. and I've never tried telling people I'm not. But then you've got a title like nutritionist, which isn't protected. So anyone can say they're a nutritionist. And then yeah. suddenly you've got nutritionists that are like, yeah, you know, apple cider vinegar, you know, you do this, you take this and you squeeze lemon in your water. And there's no, there's no kind of policies in, in control there. And again, like we touched on a little bit before with everyone becoming a doctor when it comes to anti-vaccinations and things like that. So there's, and you've got this issue with people just giving out information without having to back it up or back up mm. the facts. And you kind of have this online bias as well, where if someone's accrued a following through false information, people use the following as a credential. And oh, 100%. Yeah, suddenly people think, oh, well, they've got 200,000 followers. He, he must be, you know, the juice cleanse must be the best thing for me. Or, you know, this... You know, again, there's so many narratives that change where you've got bodybuilders who ate meat for 90% of their lives then they go vegan, jump on the trend. And they're like, yeah, you know, look at my muscles. I'm, I'm a vegan bodybuilder. You're like, bro, you gained most of that muscle tissue when you, were, when you weren't. And it's so easy to see people ride these waves without scrutiny or criticism. I mean, you're seeing this in the entrepreneur space, isn't it, Martin? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's just, I think, it, I think it's just human behavior wrapped in the fact that we've delivered this platform that allows us to hide behind our ego, right? We're able to get away with murder. And because of the lack of standards that James just articulated, right, it brings out the worst in us, right? If we want to, if we're desperate to survive or we need an opportunity to uh, stroke our ego or make some money, then we'll just come out and make a claim about anything. And, and I don't think that's industry specific. I think there's people masquerading uh, behind any discipline that they so feel uh, works. One of the ones that really surprises me is the area of personal development. You know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Everyone's into meditation and the laws of attraction. F*** me. I mean, it is so untangible 
It's unreal. It's like literally you know, swallowing an astrology bar, right? You know, I can find myself in any star sign. Now all of a sudden I can meditate and, you know, I can ultimately manifest, which is a word that should not be in the dictionary, at least not when it comes to attraction, anything I want. And, and these people have got no qualifications. There's no substantiation. Now I come from a science world. Forget science. There's no real scientific background. And, and yes, there, because of lack of standards, you can li- literally get away with whatever you want. Uh, on social media. And so the challenge is, um, what do you do about it, right? If you're not smart enough to triangulate the facts, and the average Joe punter doesn't want to say, well, look, he's got 200,000 following, I think I heard earlier. He's making this statement, let's call it the juice cleanse. Well, look, he looks pretty good as well. Oh, I love this guy. I follow him. He's really funny. He swears a bit and <laughs> me. He's asking me to buy a drink, right? That's great. But the, but the reality is, what do you do about what do you do about telling that person that if you read a bit more into it, you might be able to triangulate the facts and realize it's just what it is. The guy's got an opinion, right? It might, may or may not be a great drink, and he may or may not be making some money from it, right? But, but most, the average person won't do that. They won't triangulate the facts. What, James, what do you think social media should do about it? Or what do you think humanity should do with this kind of misrepresentation? Well, I've, I've kind of made a profession out of it, if I'm honest. That's the, the information in which I bring to market is from people much smarter than me. You know, they, uh, I think it was Einstein said something about standing on the shoulders of giants and all the pe- best people in our industries have acclaimed that from people before. And I'm definitely one of those people. And when I got into the industry, I realized I'm not going to be more experienced, I'm not going to be more muscular, I'm not going to be, you know, so many of these things. But I realized that I had a good understanding of communicating the information people needed from very scholarly, educated people, which unfortunately, and I'm sure they'd agree with me, aren't that interesting. And I thought, (laughs) do do you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to endure a podcast for 45 minutes on caffeine, just so I can get a 15 second soundbite to put in a video. So I'm there. I, I tell you what, I'm currently reading a book on menopause, right? And I will read this whole book just to probably get a snippet of 45 seconds when someone asks. And I'm just a buffer. That is it. And every time, I, my followers now send me everything. I, everyone's dobbing in anyone from any corner of the internet. I'm like, men's health, you're f***ed. This, come over here. You know, and I've kind of created a, a an industry standard where people are going, is this bullshit? And they hand it in front of me. And if I don't know, I'll go to someone smarter, get the answer and then present it as my own. You're doing the <laughs> Lord's work, and uh, James. You're doing the Lord's work, mate. <laughs> I love that you're reading a book on the menopause. You're an absolute G. You're a true feminist, bruv. I mean, when we're talking about what you do about it, it reminds me of when we were talking to Guy Kawasaki, who was working with Steve Jobs at Apple, is like head of marketing there and kind of revolutionized marketing from their perspective. And the he was his answer was quite simple, was just teach people about how to use the internet we aren't willing to do the work to discern the facts. That's the issue. And you see that in politics. You see that in every sector of society. We want the information quickly because there's too much. It's just like, all right, we just need these metrics and we're going to measure whether this is good. Everyone says it's good. This is good. And that's basically what the followers indicate. And the other issue with it is because social media is new, people don't have their parents to teach them also how to use it because their parents don't know what to do which we saw with some of the anti-vaxxers. Uh, a lot of them were older generation. I read an article in the Times about how um, it's causing like massive family friction where someone's mum is basically become an anti-vaxxer and then you've got a 15-year-old kid saying, well, my life is ruined because this is that and this is the answer. Let's follow it. And then uh, the parents get so obsessed with it because they found some Facebook group online um, that are touting facts uh, in in quotation from like people who aren't scientists and then you've got the who and people that are trained scientists like educated that people just ignore and so I think you've just got all this lack of education about how to use the internet and I just think I don't think regulation is the answer but I just think you need people to know how to deal with information do you know what I mean and to know how to 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 validate things I think I think there is there is something better that can be done though right I, I think that- which you are internet police well, I, I, I think that the, 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 there's two ways of looking at this. There's the liberal argument that says that we can rely on um, Facebook, Instagram, you know, same company or whatever, to determine for themselves that what's the best and richest experience they can give their customers. 
by making sure that people are credible and authentic, right? I mean, what is the point ultimately? I mean, it's what's happening in the dating industry, right? Dating apps have got more intelligent because they screen better, right? If they mm. didn't screen better, people got pissed off. They wouldn't buy the product when they realized that people are using pictures of themselves that were five, 10 years old, right? So they, they got better at it and those ones have succeeded. Social media doesn't want to change the ability for people to say what they want, when they want, how they want. And if that means they put in their bio, by the way, download this new ebook or, or subscribe for $5 a month to X, Y, and Z, they, they don't do it because ultimately it allows for more expression, more stickiness, more compatibility, the ability for people to live a version of their own life, even if it's bullshit. So the liberal argument is that these guys go and create a better product because ultimately the product will die if mm. it becomes oversaturated with, with something that's generally not healthy for, for humans. But it We're doesn't there, die. Right? It doesn't well, die, it, though. No, it doesn't. Saying. Yeah. But the other, but so the, the, um, so that's a dystopian world that we're going to live in if it carries on in that way, right? But the other argument is, yes, you know, regulation, where you, you think of citations as worked pretty well for Wikipedia. I like the idea that if James wants to say in a podcast or, you know, anywhere, you, you know, say, that, yeah. that he, no, he says that and says, well, you know, I'm a buffer, or, or this is my opinion, or what the f*** do I care? You say, fine. However, if James puts on his social media bio that I'm, X, Y, and Z, and I've got and I've had re reached one billion followers. Right, I would love to think that someone like Instagram, Facebook, where they physically rely on data to use the senses of the consumer, meaning I'm going to read it and go, "Whoa, this guy's great! He's got half a million followers, and he's telling me he's X, Y, and Z." That we that we force people to go down a level and have it citationed, and and if you look at Wikipedia, whilst we know it's easier. You know, some media outlets aren't allowed, some they do approve. The Wikipedians, by and large, do an okay job in at least second and third referencing. It makes the bar higher before you can just peacock or make claims, right? And I think it, I think social media could do that. I think but social, social media, media is more of an entertainment platform. And I want to move on to mental health implications of social media. By that, I mean seeing someone with an idyllic looking body all year round, carpet bombing your news feeds and uh, making you feel like you can look like that, even though you probably can't, as you've just alluded to. The same goes for seeing people constantly posting that they're making a lot of money on my days. This gets on my tits. I can't lie to you. S oh, the FX traders out there, like you just get allured into the, to the mirage of it. And you're like, ooh, well, maybe they've got something we don't know about. Tell me about mental health when around all of that, what, what do you think the implications are? Uh, a guy that I train jujitsu with, he uh, rents out private jets, like charters them, and he gets offers for people to have pictures in them when they're grounded. And yeah. he said, he pretty much said to them, F off, you can pay me what it costs to have it in the air if you want to sit in it. He's like, that's not... rude. <laughs> but like, I, I kind of rate it because otherwise, rather than getting, I don't know, seven grand an hour in the air, he's... They, they're like, oh, we'll give you a thousand pounds to come do a photo shoot. And you're like, what, what are you trying to prove? I've seen someone get uh, baited as well on a flight where this girl, an influencer, sat in business class, got the photo, and then someone else has got a picture of her sat in economy. So she just sat in someone else's seat, first on the plane, just to get the photo, and then goes to sit in her seat in economy. No way. <laughs> it, it happens all the time I've, I've, I've never seen it i'd be too scared to do that like i would never and you know what I'll, I'll shamelessly say it so i've got a pretty ridiculous uh trainer collection and i love like some off-white trainers and my trainer dealer in oz he sold me pairs before that have been worn once worn once <laughs> just fine bro and i'm, I'm like someone's just lost a hundred pounds to wear a trainer once for a photo in it and I'm, I'm happy to pay $100 less and just have something that's been more once because I, wa I want the trainer. And I'm thinking, who's doing this? But with the, with the physique stuff, like uh, the, for me, I don't take myself too seriously. And like, I was in Ibiza last week and I'm taking some photos and I'm like, oh, big chest and getting lean so pre-pandemic. And a lot of dudes messaged me from that saying, thank you for posting that because it's made me feel better about myself. And there are other PTs out there that must be fuming. They've just dieted for 12 weeks. They're like, why, why are people enjoying the fact he didn't make an effort? But mental health is a really interesting one. But one thing you might agree with me or disagree with me on this, I haven't spoken about mental health in the last six to 12 months because it seems now to be a competition of who's had it the worst. 
Yeah, true. And so I'm like, hey guys, uh, you know, if you ever want to talk, make sure you speak to someone. A problem spoken about as a problem halved. Then someone else, 50 minutes later, I tried killing myself last year. I'm like, whoa, okay, you've just you tried to trump me, and I'm not to, you know, negate or or minimize that as an experience. But I'm, then suddenly all these posts come out, and it seems like who's got the best story about mm. struggling, and we've got very far removed from the original conversation and. So it's even become a bit of an interesting landscape now for the mental health discussion, but what, especially everyone making their lives seem picture perfect. And then the polar opposite being like people having these posts about how low their lives have got. We've got this again, massive extremes on either end of the spectrum. And I'm, I'm not sure how that's helping the normal person. That's a great response. That really is. And, and I tend to, I tend to agree. I think that the subjects become, um, you know, too much of a, a source for entertainment, right? That, that you know, if someone wants to um, soothe their ego or get attention, um, you know, they will overexpress or let's say overreach, as you coined earlier on, right? In this subject that's actually really, really serious, right? Mm. And, and and I wished actually that in some areas of life, particularly in social media, I wish certain subjects were were dumbed down, uh, became taboo. Right. Whereas, you know, we don't have to have freedom of expression to such a level that we just decide to permeate through everything. And we tend to just give an opinion on everything. And I think mental health, other than to say, if you're, if you're struggling with it, you should get support. And here's where you should go and get support. And we feel fear, you know, try and resist or desist from saying, well, tell me what that story is. Tell us your life story. It really it gets to your point. What is it really doing for other people? In fact, what we're doing is we're shining a light on stuff that's abstract, that may not be truthful, mm-hmm. and it's telling us something dark and deep about humanity. And again, I think that chaotic society that, that indulges in that is probably a bad thing. And I agree, this one-upmanship, um, it's more that we see it as a source of a commercial, the source of entertainment, something else to buy into that's a really worrying place when we get to that kind of level. I think uh, from a mental health perspective as well, like it also n- negates, it has a, a false impression of productivity where getting on wearing certain types of, you can like look a certain way and look like you've been successful. And it kind of, that's the message I get across. And I feel like then you strive for that instead of actually, you know, doing the work or and preparing and working on the skill set and actually offering some value into this world. And I think it's a different experience for people at different age groups as well. Like uh, someone who's 16 that looks at someone who's 20, like it's actually mad. Like I'll have, a younger cousin of ours telling me about this person's just bought a Bentley and they're 22 or whatever. And they talk about it like it's nothing. And when I was 18, I didn't even know what a Bentley was, bro. Like it, I, I don't, I only started to talk about those things when I started to move around people that had Bentleys. Do you know what I mean? And the, and, but that was, these are people that had years of excelling, you know what I mean? In whatever it is. And that was a byproduct of it rather than the first thing they look at. Do you know what I mean? And I think the from a mental health perspective as well, it, it's like it makes you feel like for not having it. So you try and solve that problem, but then without what realizing the years it takes to actually achieve that meaningfully and without going bankrupt. Because that's the other thing. I've read about it where someone will buy a Lambo, can't afford the insurance. Bro, Lambo insurance is like at least 10 grand a year. Like it's not a joke. I think there's uh two things that I've kind of learned about the whole debate. Number one is a lot of people think that success is a way out. They go, oh, if I had more money, if I had more recognition, if I had more fame, it would make things better. But people don't realize that mental health doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. And I actually find okay. that people that have genuine problems in life are almost in some respects preoccupied. And when mm. you don't have as many problems in life and you, have, you are successful and you have money, suddenly you sit back and you go, wow, I've got a lot of money in the bank and I'm still feeling low. You go, Mm. I've got a lot of success and fame and I'm still feeling low. And then they start beating themselves up going, why have I got so much and why aren't I happy? I feel like they get into Mm. an even deeper despair and they they feel like they can't talk about it because when they say to their friend, hey, I'm I'm not feeling so good. They're like, oh, what do you mean? You know, you just bought a Bentley. You've got that big house. You've got that hot missus. And then the only kind of input I give around the discussion is I see mental health being like a table that has loads of legs. 
And we need to identify those legs, you know, mm. nature, spending time outside, getting sunlight, stress, not having too much of it, family, seeing them a lot, purpose, all of these things. And sometimes people can neglect these legs of the table. And if you kick out enough of the legs, it's going to fall over. And I, this is the only basic thing. People go, oh, if I get fit, will I have better mental health? I'm like, well, we're, we're kind of looking at one leg. I think you should try and do that, but let's not neglect all the other things. And if you haven't been outside in a while and you're not getting sunlight and you haven't seen your family in a long time, you're going to struggle to have something sturdy. That is a big point. I like that. Great analogy, mate. Let's talk about purchased influence. One of the big issues that we're seeing, and it often gets a lot of chatter because it's systemic to social media is where people purchase influence. So like buying followers, buying likes, comments. And while a lot of people are able to spot it, your kind of passive user don't care perhaps, or they don't know what's going on. Um, but you've come across, I'm sure, a lot of this stuff within the industry you work in and uh, you see how the effect of having millions of followers gives you credibility. Um, it's a loaded question, but do you see it a lot? Do you know what? I've, I just spotted someone the other day. So if you go onto socialblade.co.uk or socialblade.com, yep. you can get an audit of people's following changes over the last two, three weeks. You create an account for free. And sometimes I look at people and I'm just just doing my due diligence. I'm like, oh, this person started posting a lot recently. Let's have a look. And I see their bleeding followers. And I'm like, oh. And sometimes people can be very desperate when that happens because they take it personally. But there's mm. one person in the industry and I won't out them. I was thinking, every time I've checked, she's losing followers, but she's still remained above the 1 million mark. And then I looked and I caught plus 10,000 in a day. And I was like, hold on, there's a trend here. I'm not sure if she's doing it or a PR team are doing it but someone is buying 10,000 followers to keep her above that 1 million mark. This happens to a lot of people on Love Island as well. They're clutching hold of that 1 million and the second they drop to having triple figures, boom, complete change of attitude towards their social media, what they're worth. Going into a restaurant, you go to Nusrat, suddenly you've only got 995,000 followers. You're not getting the same level of service. You know, you're not, you're not getting the same I as you would. <laughs> you ain't getting that free meal. Yeah. <laughs> So there's, yeah, there is, there is that. And like, for me, I, I do care about, obviously do care about my socials and things like that. But every once in a while, I like to do a purge where I say something overly offensive to try and get people out. And I'm so confident for every thousand followers I gain, I lose 500. I've got a massive churn rate, but I'm kind of proud of it. And for me, people need to understand that the most important thing is how that amount of people serves you, not how that yeah. amount of people is. Because Ultimately, it's about running a business. It's about operating something behind the scenes. All social media should be to anyone who knows what they're doing is the entry level to their sales funnel. That is it. Yes. And it's a marketing tool. That is it. And yeah. I say to all my friends and my family, I go, if I didn't need this for my business, I would not use it because my, the amount of privacy I've had to give up to operate an online business. Like I've even in IB for the other day, met some girls by the pool. And they were like, oh, what's your name? What do you do? And I asked them about what they did. And I remembered one of them messaged me three weeks ago. And they were like, oh, hi, here's James, is it? Oh, who's this? And I was like, you f***ing messaged me three weeks ago. Now you're pretending that this is the first time we've met. And I was like, wow, you're lying to me. And I've everywhere I go, anything I do now, I'm always a little bit on edge with people. I met two girls in, in LA and me and my friend, we went out for drinks with them. And when we got smashed, one of them went, I love your podcast. And I went, but you don't follow me. She goes, oh, me and my friend unfollowed you the second we met you. And I was like, whoa. I was like, what? Yeah. Why? Just because they wanted, they, they didn't want it to be that kind of dynamic with people. So people need to understand that if you're going to put yourself out to millions of people or try and grow this big presence, you might as well be making a ludicrous business out of it because otherwise you're just giving away all your privacy for nothing. And Tim Ferriss said it in a, in a message recently. He goes, if you want to be rich and famous, try being rich first. It kind of depresses me a bit. The, 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 you look it, depressed. I can't it, like you. It, I'm here smiling because James giving me the banter about his girls in LA and then you're like, oh, this is pain. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's like, I mean, a Ferris is statement about try being rich. I mean, if you had to pick one, it's like, just, 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 just go, go the least path of resistance. And it's hard enough. Entrepreneurship is hard enough. that If you're then giving away your personal privacy and your whole life's being affected, um, that's, a, that's a pretty difficult life. And to be honest, I think it's really hard to get rich uh, just as a social media personality. I just think that that, I think, by the way, I think that's a pretty shit job. Look, I think 
he said something quite valid and i think i want to flag it where your feed is not something your amount of followers unless you're purely trading in perception only like some people where you don't have a core product but your followers aren't a reflection of the success of your product and you see it is just a marketing funnel uh to attract eyes and ho- and a percentage of that will uh like give you money basically and i think that all come to a gig because i see it all the time as well like for the level of success i've had from a sales perspective of my records is not reflective of my social media following and i could turn up and do a festival for uh in front of fifth like 60,000 people and they can have a great time and I'll look at the stories afterwards of people tagging me and I can guarantee you most of them don't follow me and in fact most of them once they um if you actually look at who they're following don't follow any musicians they're following like uh models or following um you know Kardashians or whatever because they like to there's culture with following as well like who uh, I see you know the, the early doors is when you don't follow anyone and that's like pure elitism yeah and like uh or people only follow their friends etc etc and you can't it doesn't mean they don't like what you're doing it's not personal do you know what i mean so i think it's worth people remembering that when they're starting their businesses do you know what i mean and that's another reason why i say to people to be very careful when they do go on shows like love island For a guy who's now my friend came off the show and he was saying to me i'm trying to run a pt business and i'm losing followers and i was like mate they're just not interested in following you. That doesn't mean they don't like you. It doesn't mean they're not going to come yeah. up and ask for a selfie in the street. They're just not maybe interested in PT. Maybe they've got a PT. And so many people take that as, as such a, you know, a dig. Like you, if given the choice, would you rather have a bigger following or bigger crowds? And I mean, like you, no one in their right mind would pick the following over the crowd. And it, it's one of those things. Even example, I didn't follow him until six months ago. I, his Instagram was so removed from his music. If someone, if that song came on a club, I'd be like, I love this. But then it's the same, exact same thing. I think that so many people that run in a business, you just need to ensure that, like you say, you see that as just entry level. It's not who you are. It's not your self-worth. And at the end of the day, you know, having a, there are loads of people with big followings who are skin. But what I would say to you is that, that it's become a reference for uh, the Gen Z population, right? So, you know, I look at it, you can either, you first of all can only see it as a channel. That's all it is. It's an outpost, right? And and it isn't going to be your most uh, voracious uh, you know, channel. It's not going to be your most, uh, your, uh, your most in- induced effort channel. You know, there are many, many different ways that you do sales and marketing. But also, it's quite possible that it's just a marketing stand. It's quite possible that it's referenceability. It makes sure that people believe you've got a pulse, that you've got a message. But it may actually not be an active sales channel at all. And so some people can do both. They can drive it as an active sales channel and other people can use it as a marketing outpost. But it is at the end of the day, just a channel. And I think if people understand that, then they're not trying to throw their whole life into one thing. Because I think this is the problem. Too many people in the Gen Z world think business is easy. They think life is easy. They live, they're brought up in a sensitized world, right, where they probably didn't come from nothing. I don't know about you, James, but Jax and I, we came from nothing, right? And we've both made it, or in this new world would be considered made it, right? But then they get on social media and they think, I can just make easy money. I've tossed the rule book out the window, right? I don't need any f***ing university. I don't need any skills. You know, just tell me. <laughs> Just, just tell me I look good or I said something great and I can probably manifest anything you want in your life. Pay me twenty nine ninety five a month, right? It's bullshit. It's just complete bullshit. So I feel sorry for those people that want to see social media as more than just a channel. Yeah. That's my rant for the day. 100%. And I 100% agree with it. And people, when they meet me in real life or talk to me online, they're like, oh, you're a bit different to social media. I'm like, when you need someone, if you want to approach someone with their number in a bar, you have to become a much more audacious version of yourself to go pester that person. Yeah. And that is all social media is. That's why I swear at people. I'm very polite. I meet people's parents. I never swear in front of them. And they're like, oh, <laughs> wait, there's a disconnect here, James. You're a bit of a prick online. And in real life, you're quite nice. And I was like, you just have to be the identity you need to get the number. And that is all social media is. And it's such a shame seeing so many people online and sliding into DMs of restaurants, trying to get free bookings and stuff. Because... In 20 years' time, when Instagram is the new MySpace, we're going to be in a very different kind of position, aren't we? So we've just talked about quick fixes. 
people um kind of where people want quick fix overnight and by the way you do get quick fixes i think crypto that environment is the most beautiful uh, illusion of quick fix where people are like right guys i can become a millionaire in a week if i just bust out an nft right now and i like i even got people in my own team talking about it's like dude Let's just focus on what we're doing and we'll let that let that simmer over there. They, these guys have been in it for a while. Don't worry about it. But like the key here, though, is it you need some for, for you to have some sort of long term success. You need some sort of skill set. You need to have an education. You need to be doing what you're doing. And is the idea of an education dying? Do you know what I'm saying? Where recently you've been posting a lot in the last couple of weeks about clickbait stories in the media. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of what you're saying about it is that a lot of what they're talking about is more complicated than a tweet. Expand on that for us. So we've all seen this over the years. I think that maybe five, 10 years ago, it was only when you got to the bottom of a blog that you saw the real shit. It was like six mistakes housewives have been making when cleaning surfaces. And suddenly women <laughs> reading that are like, oh my God, what are the six mistakes that housewives are making cleaning surfaces? And then... That you saw that, you knew it was the end of the article because it was utter shit. But now, with printed press dying on its ass, newspapers not being bought as much, like you say, that generation of newspaper buyers like my parents are moving up and the, the people filling the gaps between Gen Z, Gen C, like, it, it's not the same. And suddenly now everything's online and there needs to be monetization. So now traffic is the currency of the modern day. And these, even like Lad Bible. They post great stuff, but every once in a while they post one crazy story for full story click link in bio. And then you're like, nah, that's clickbait. And you go for a piss and you're like, oh, I'm going back to Lad Bible just to see what that story's about. We can't help ourselves. And you can mislead people with the shortest amount of characters. You know, yeah. even this week, it's not how much you eat, it's what you eat. And that's a really yeah. misleading statement that could have so many different outcomes. Yeah. And and it it's, it's so obvious for a lot of people that all people are trying to do is get you to their site, no matter what. And the ethics in that initial part of the funnel have been completely skewed. And before, editors were there like, yeah, let's get this press out. Let's get a well-written story. Now people at the Daily Mail are probably whipping, being like, guys, we need to get 10,000 clicks to the site today or you're all fired. I mean, the, I saw a Lad Bible post where it, they're basically pushing false information off of hearsay there was something about uh, we were going into another lockdown that they were and the way they wrote it was it literally the comments were in uproar we can't have another lockdown and then I, I think i had like 10 people that day talking to me about lockdowns uh and the next day the new news story disappeared uh when the current health secretary i think he went on andrew marr and just confirmed it's like there is no lockdown coming like and i think it was just a passing comment that just got drawn out but then when you've got a channel like lad bible i don't know how many millions of followers they have now but like that becomes news do you know what i mean and it that spreads paranoia but i would argue much like what we were saying earlier about social media and this leads me on to the next question is mainstream media have succumbed to the clickbait culture but has it always been there because they're there to provide entertainment as well people forget that about the news i think that the human psyche towards news is changing as well in the sense that tiktok worries me and it worries me how much i like it because you now i think you have less than three seconds to get someone's attention like mm -hmm. before you'd sit down with a newspaper you'd open it you'd be like right what have we got today and you'd be like having a nice little read through and you'd be having your toast in the morning now it's boom if you haven't captured me in three seconds i'm gone i'm on to the next thing so i think that it is keeping up with the times quite a, quite a lot of the time i think they always have been trying to bring compelling news and twisting stories but now it it, it seems like nothing's nothing's too much nothing's going to be out of limits to when it comes to getting traffic to your website because if you're going to get 1% of people hitting your website, clicking on an advert, which is going to get you monetary revenue, that game is so much different to how it was before, where before it was your front page. Your front page had to get them to pick up the paper and buy it. And now it's so much more than that. So I'm not sure. I think the landscape of even just attention spans is crazy. Now a movie has died. You either watch a one hour series or you watch, you know, whole combined. The idea of sitting down two and a half hours, people are like, nah. They're like, I can't do that. If there's a series that's broken up into one hour episodes, suddenly that's fine. Or a YouTube video that's 12 minutes. But suddenly that 
that routine of sitting down on a Friday evening at 7 p.m. and watching a film for two and a half hours. It feels like the attention span of humans isn't there anymore. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a tragedy of where we've evolved to, and that's that uh, information has become so fast because of the internet, like it's delivered in light speed. As a result of that, we've created this fishbowl syndrome where, you know, the, the goldfish is turning from one end or the other and it just literally can't take too much in because they're awash and saturated with information around them. And it's not just the things you said. It's it's all the social media. It's all of the digital web, right? It is it is streaming. There's a lot of different considerations, YouTube. So it, I don't think that film is... Of course, I'm biased because one of my businesses is, is film and um, I've been in film, God, almost, almost 30 years and and I don't believe it's dead as a uh, as, as a platform. I think we're competing with a lot of other things. And so you're right. When you start to say, where's my hour and a half, two hours to sit down with your partner, your wife or your kids or whatever to watch a movie, it's got to be something huge. Um, or you've got to be more of an auteur, someone that likes that format because there's just so much choice. So things that people have to find their way uh, to prioritize and balance what you know, what where they want to spend their time. I think there's a, a day of reckoning uh, coming to uh, to places like YouTube where if something's of functional value, you'll go there, um, but you'll you'll start to look for that longer form content again. I think there's a desire to get past this this clickbait type world of TikTok where we just want to be entertained for thirty seconds. After a while, to me, it becomes demoralizing. Um, I find it. I find it almost like a cancer. I can. I can watch it for a little bit or reels on Instagram, and then after that, it's like, do me a favor. You're turning me into a moron, right? You know, that could, that's looking at whether a cat is smiling or not, right? Um, or whether a dog should be pushed a little faster in the pram. I mean, come on. It is. I completely agree with that. And like, uh, what kills me is so many of my friends. This actually annoys me. If I give them a good film recommendation. They would rather watch a film they've already seen so they can use their phone when they watch it. So I, I give them so many film recommendations. I'm like, oh, have you seen it yet? Have you seen it yet? I watched a great film recently called Nobody with the guy from Better Call Saul. And it, it really surprised me. And I said to my friend, oh, have you watched it? And he's watching Avengers again. He's watched that 50, 60 times. And he's doing it just so we can idle, idle, just scroll away on social media without having to actually commit to either of them. And I was wow. like, wow. We're like, if we had to depict this in a cartoon of people just walking around all day staring at a, a little screen and a little phone and just not listening to people, what they're saying, not watching films. And it it, it is going into a place where we all zombies were like, oh, what are the death rates today? What are the infections? What's the vaccination rate? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is scary. It's, a, 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 it's kind of an apocalyptic digital world. I mean, it's an interesting topic that I think is another podcast where we talk about the effect of all this stuff on consumer habits, because that's what you're kind of talking about. And I think it um, it is a different experience, again, what age range you are, because I would argue, Martin, your need for long form content is more reflecting of you knowing more about long form content. Whereas if someone's growing up now where they've always been given 30 second reels, they don't need that stuff. Do you know what I'm saying well, you, and they have no experience know. of it meaning something to them. So, for example, I feel that about music, right? If you t- nowadays, I, we spoke about this the other night. I would argue that you, a Bohemian Rhapsody couldn't exist today because no one wants to f- hear a seven minute piece of music. They want something that they can digest in ninety seconds. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and it's yeah. and especially with the nature of streaming, it's more about repeatability rather than something you immerse yourself in and then perhaps listen to again later. Do you know what I mean people want to? put on a drake album just let it run and they all kind of like merge into one another do you know what i mean and there's no real ups and downs do you know what i mean it's just like it's nice do you know what i mean and i think um song length has been affected by that um that idea especially when we're chasing commerciality do you know what i mean and i think it is interesting from a futurist perspective about whether the generation that live this environment now who have less experience and only the real lovers of music might go back and listen to Bohemian Rhapsody or all that kind of stuff. Will they actually care? Do they care? I don't think they do. But that's just my two pence. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever watch films from like the 90s now? And like you're looking at them and you go, you don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming. People sat around the dinner table just chatting to each other with no fucking electric devices. And I'm there and I'm thinking, 
you don't know what's coming. And do you know what? I wrote a marketing email about this yesterday. Bruce Willis in Armageddon, 1998. He's going bald. No one gave a shit. He is the most masculine f***ing character in that film. He's going on a spaceship to land on a meteorite to put a nuke in it to save the world. No one cares yeah. he's receding, right? Nowadays, if a main actor was to do that, people would be like, oh, no, you need to send him to Turkey first. Just all the, sta- <laughs> all the standards across films are changing. And I look back and I looked at his receding hairline and I thought, what a time to be alive the 90s would have been. It's interesting, Tim, you said earlier that, you know, it depends on the age gap. I mean, at the end of the day, it's very obvious. If you're not exposed to something, then you don't know what you don't know. That's what I'm but, saying. But, but, but it is true. But on the other hand, um, I tend to have hope in humanity that when we're pinched, well, I tend to be a glass half full guy. That, that if if, oh if something days, doesn't bro. work, you're at risk of sounding like an anorak. Be careful right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just think that if something's bad, eventually humanity corrects it, right? But I think one way we correct it is that we need visionaries and we need storytellers and we need to tell new stories of value. So film has a, a job to do whether it's people like me that are funding it from both sides or others, but to describe that value to the other audiences, to other generations. If, if people want to go back to reading books, we have to describe the value for, from that storytelling. We need to tell ourselves new stories about why these things exist. So, And it kind of, in my opinion, just helps humanity evolve and think and become aware of, of why we do the things that we do. Otherwise, what happens is, in this light speed of, 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 or this nodal network is that we just react to whatever's in front of us. And if we don't know any better, we stay there probably longer than we need to. So with my sons and my, my, and, and my daughter, I, you know, I tell them about these things. I tell them about, like, you know, I'm a, a, obviously a huge movie lover. So I tell them that they've got to go and look at the, you know, the classics and where's great character portrayals, you know, why are, the, why are certain songs, their stories rather iconic? And we'll go and talk about movies that, that create conversation. And, and yes, that means that they've got to go and book a couple of hours out of their schedule, right? But I, I ultimately believe that people find uh, their own path and they correct when they need to correct. The problem is sometimes it can take a long time. And I think that's what we're seeing with the, some of the value that social media has created rather than the negative. And we're still going through that. We're not past it. Mm. On top of having other light speed type information and entertainment like YouTube, where, you know, it's just, I mean, it's incredibly addictive. If I want to find something, I pretty much know I can get it on YouTube, yeah. no matter what, right? And, and it, you know, I think, and if I've only got five minutes of time, this is that great question, James. You're good at describing situations or situational analysis. But one of the great ones is we say to ourselves, I've only got five minutes. What should I do? Bang. Here we go. YouTube. Right. Now I measure my time in small blocks. So if I, I'm constantly under pressure. So I say, where's my source of entertainment? Boom. It's YouTube. It, that's a bit of a problem. Keeping it on about click, mate. And I think it's interesting because we're talking about real information. And I just want to pick up with you about your comments about men's health. And we're not here to talk about weight loss or nothing, but it's more about the fact that the article that you were criticizing saying that, it's not about how much you eat, but what you eat that prevents people from losing weight. It even cited a report in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Surely, even with Martin's reference about Wikipedia, that's meant to then have some gravitas. But you still called it out for clickbait. Talk us through that. Because it's the title that I think the majority of people are reading and going, that's it. I don't think they're going yeah. to go decipher it afterwards. And even with some of the studies that come out, it's how people... Uh, make that data look. So for instance, uh, red meat is associated with increased chances of, of developing cancer, prostate cancer, I believe. However, you can't just stop there because there needs to be an explanation behind it. Now, if you were to split people into two, two camps, health-seeking populations and non-health-seeking populations, people that wake up, go to bed at the right time, eat fruit each day, have a salad once a week, whatever, and then the people that just do not give a f- about their existence, which exist, you would come to the conclusion and the data would support it. There is more red meat consumed by the people that do not care about their health. If we were to look at fry ups, takeaways, curries, you know, burgers, bacon, all of these things, which on their own can be part of a healthy diet, they yeah. sit within the camp of the non health seeking populations. And even if I take someone from that population and I bring them into a health seeking population, I PT them. 
they swap a few of their burgers for chicken or you know they swap their fry up for an acai bowl or whatever it is the data on its own and the, the the comment is true but we need to decipher that to let people know that eating steak is not going to give you cancer although the the actual evidence stipulates higher consumption of red meat is correlated with prostate cancer because we need more context after that we need to really decipher and make the evidence clear to people same way that kellogg's in the 70s came up with the the study uh on breakfast consumption where two camps two groups of people one just ate lunch one ate breakfast and lunch and the people that ate breakfast and lunch had less calories at lunch the people that just had lunch had more calories at lunch but they kept the fact closed and quiet that their overall calories were lessened so they got that kellogg study and came forward and go don't skip breakfast or you'll eat more at lunch it was still a net reduction of food so although the studies are, are accurate without the context that's behind them they can still be hugely misleading for people's agenda so I, i'll be honest with you i didn't even read into the study or look into it i was like nah i know what you're doing and i don't like it I think it comes down to entertainment still. I can't lie to you because I've seen this before and I've, I've spoken to doctors about this where often journalists will cite studies and the correlation, like for example, when you see like food studies, there'll be like a variety of correlations, right? That And perhaps it would just be like hot chocolate affects your chance of fertility and it'll just be like 0.1%, but it still came up and that will become the headline do you know what i mean and i think at what point does it become propaganda do you know what i mean and is it the journalist's job to 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 decipher that and i guess the next question is how can people be better educated about the issues that they want to know more about whether it's finances investments health or well-being with all of this out there what do you suggest i think um when you said about the correlation i bet martin's scientific brain was saying correlation is not causation and that's what yep. <laughs> I, I bet that was ticking in his head straight away. And um, in, in one of my books, I wrote about if an ambulance turns up to a car crash on the M25, statistically speaking, that person's more likely to die. But that doesn't mean that ambulances kill people. And Got you. that would be the same way of saying the, the two things there. It's a difficult one. I'm not sure of the answer because like you say, there's always going to be this stuff here. But I suppose my key purpose in life as a trainer is to educate people with the fundamentals and when i when i say to them look you've gained weight because more money has gone in the bank than has been spent and if you want to lose weight you've got to spend more money out the bank than's being earned if i can drill into them that and i'm a king of analogies by the way if i can drill that into someone then they almost have like a bull, bull detector and someone comes along and goes you must be in a state of ketosis they think about the bank account they go I'm not sure that's going to work and i mean if you were to educate someone briefly on stock markets and ponzi schemes then suddenly when crypto comes along they might go hmm this this seems a little bit too convenient that i'm going to buy into dogecoin and my money is going to quadruple could it yes <laughs> but you could put it your could. money could yeah. put your money into loads of places where it could quadruple but when you look at the volatility of it and what's happened to markets before suddenly i think people if you if they can have that basic you know they could watch money explained on netflix you know what i mean watch that and get a better understanding for it but the onus has to be on people to get this base level of education and i don't think people are willing to do that how do you educate people martin well i think there's a there's a few things here i think by you know, by adopted practice is what is probably the, the main one right because they physically are touched by by the process so that's what we experience every day of our life if we, when we travel through life we do something there's a cause and effect and that's the most powerful way to educate us. It's, it's our own reality. Another way is that we do it through respect and, and loyalty. So we feel we become loyal to a subject, to a group, to a following, to an individual. Um, and it could be our teacher, it could be our parents. And those are, and this is why nurture, uh, nurtured education is so powerful. Um, and if it's all we know, um, it, it can be more powerful than what we know as a, in, in terms of who we are ourselves. And then we have what we call accepted practices. And this is really powerful if, we, if we've not moved into a society where we distrust stuff. And this is what's so scary about today's world is it used to be that if you were a trained accountant or you, but let's just say um, you were um, a music producer or a singer, it doesn't matter, or a, or a car salesman, there was an accepted practice of what that meant to be that. 
There were there was a way into the industry. There was a set of tools you had to learn. There was a qualification that people said, "Ah, oh, you can't do that. You can't become a lawyer unless you get your your bar exam or your double JD law, etc." What has happened is that today's world, saturated by information and a few of those bad eggs that that are, are pushing, uh, whether it be fake media and everything, is that what's happened is people now mistrust so much of what's out there that they toss the rule book, rule book out the window. And we've lost this third powerful leg on the stool or, or, or pillar, whatever you want to call it, where there are a load of accepted practices that you can rely on. Today, it seems to me like uh, if we're not careful, uh, we're going to see a lot more of that dystopian, dystopian universe that, 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 that I think you see in movies. Uh, and that's because of a fundamental mistrust that's happening in society. Mm. And sadly, social media is a contributory force to that. Now, if we want to know whether the vaccine works, we'll go to a guy with a beard that's sitting in his basement in Perth in Australia, telling the world how Pfizer's better than anything else. But guess what? Not for vaccines. Right? You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's scary. I'm, I'm, I'm very alarmed. There's one guy called Dave Asprey. <laughs> this is the f- bulletproof guy, bulletproof coffee guy. F- Hell, yeah, that book, and he and he's there getting people to put butter in their coffee. Uh, yeah. He's yeah. there. He's like, yeah, man, I want to live to at least 140. And I'm like, mate, th- this guy just shut shit. and he talks about the fact that fasting is anti aging. And I'm like, he's a best selling author. I'm like, how how has this happened? At some point, you know, there was enough bullshit. His idea is if you put butter in your coffee that your insulin would remain low because there'd be no carbohydrates consumed. So therefore the pancreas wouldn't have to manage the blood sugar. And people are there literally blending, right? A a dollar per milk, no longer. He's just, and sometimes I would love to get him on a lie detector test and just put put the thing over his finger and go, do you believe your own bullshit? And if yes, to the mental asylum. And if no, delete your socials. Oh, I found him. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, so this is this the guy who's created biohacking, CEO of Upgrade yeah. Labs. I mean, if you, you, Martin, you were just talking about putting in your bio about citations, qualifications. Like, right, how would right. you spot that this guy is a wanker? Like, how? There's no fucking well, hope. Well, 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 first of all, you know, you, you know, first of all, you got to define wanker. Right. I mean, I mean, for, you know, at the end of the day, it's if, if term, we're talking bro. about, if we're talking about misrepresentation, then, then yeah, it's quite possible him and others are, are wankers. I mean, he did write a book. I did glance it and, and I read it and I thought, oh, this is tough because it was lacking real scientific evidence for me. Well, I'm just reading here an Express article, uh, a Labour MP called Tom Watson. He lost seven stone by drinking bulletproof coffee. Uh, this was in 2018. I mean, it's quite a big transformation. I'll put the link on the notes for anyone that wants to check it out. Maybe it does work, James. Maybe you're just being hard. No, he on the didn't. Man. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. If, if there would have been other habitual <laughs> things that would have happened, and, and do you know what? Like people buy into systems, and it gives them belief. And that we can't discredit. Intermittent fasting, for instance, is skipping breakfast. Now, if that gives someone the power to be hungry at 10 a.m. and look at their watch and go, "No, I've got to wait three hours," that's great. Because a lot of the time they look at their watch and go, oh. that guy that posts that is Greg. Is it what's his name? Greg, some Kino body. Oh, Kino. Yeah, yeah. I've seen him. The Canadian guy. Yeah, he's intermittent fasting guy. His dad was a massive property tycoon in Canada, and he lives in a mansion. So I, I was like, nah, he's not made this much money. So I did the googling, family wealth, found out that his dad's a property tycoon. And do you know what? I'm not sure if it was scrutinism or pure jealousy of his house. So I left, I left the argument at that point. I've never butted heads with him because I was like, there's, there's a conflict of interest here. I could be jealous of this guy because he's not a bad looking lad. He's got a dreamy physique. He can strike by the looks of it on his dummy and he lives in a mansion and he could be everything that I want to be in life. So I just exited the conversation. Oh my God. I, I bought, uh, at, least, I bought, at least you're honest. For the record, James, I, I thought that you I think you come across well on your Instagram and I also enjoyed you in real life I think it's I think it matches well people just a bit people a bit sensitive man a bit of swearing a bit of harsh opinions I enjoy it thank you very much I'm flattered by that <laughs>